Welcome to Scandal Water, where the tea is hot and the conversation lively. Your hosts, Candy and Ashley, will discuss a peculiar story somehow related to the entertainment industry. This podcast might not change the world, but it just might satisfy your thirst for an intriguing tale. Oh, it's that time of day. Tune in and hear what the ladies say. It's time to bend your ear when the silver screen appears. Stories about the stage and screen and everything in between. So come on and join the fun. The curtain opens in three, two, one. It was a dark and stormy night. But it wasn't, was it, Ashley? No, it was actually very lovely and temperate. Wasn't it? In fact, it was almost a bit warm. It was, yes. What are we talking about? We are talking about the field trip that we had last night to go behind the scenes of the Louisville Jack-O-Lantern Spectacular. And it was spectacular. Wasn't it? Yes. I had no idea what we were in for. It was the most interesting and also lovely experience Mm -hmm. because Mm -hmm. we got to go in first as learners, Mm -hmm. people who didn't really know much about the process Mm -hmm. of carving pumpkins, creating a display of this size, all the the logistical elements that go into it. You know how much we didn't know, Candy? I thought they did it for volunteer. (laughs) You you mean the artists? The artists. I was convinced that because we're in community theater, these artists do this work for free. And I was like, wow, these people are so committed. So I felt so dumb. But yes, you will learn. You will learn that, no, it is not all volunteer. No, it is not. not. But after having a chance to look behind the scenes of the artistry and the logistical aspect Mm -hmm. behind it, then we got to go out on the trail. Mm -hmm. We had a sneak peek because actually tonight is when it first opened. They had their pre-lit bash tonight and then it officially opens to the public tomorrow. So guys, for our theme of pulling back the curtain and in honor of Halloween season. This episode, we take you with us to the Jack-O-Lantern Spectacular so that you can experience some of this firsthand behind the scenes knowledge with us. Yes. And you know, Ashley. Yes. You know by now, I really do love Halloween, you right? love Halloween, yes. So <laughs> what's more fun than using some famous quotes mm-hmm. from Halloween movies or spooky movies as our transitions? That you're you're going to go with me, right? I will. Okay, I will go okay. with you. I will allow it. I will allow it. Yes. And so thank you to the members of the theater downstream, the production Night of the Living Dead radio show, which opens on Friday. They were kind enough to do some of these, a few of these quotes that uh, that you commissioned from them. And thank you also to the wonderful production team behind the Louisville Jack-O-Lantern Spectacular. You're about to meet them. Mm-hmm. They were so kind and so gracious. And we just so appreciate this opportunity to take this field trip and to learn about an event that means so much to our local community. Absolutely. She just goes a little mad sometimes. We all go a little mad sometimes. Haven't you? It might have seemed like a mad idea, but it actually turned into the fabulous event that we have today. Let's hear from Brooke. My name is Brooke Pardue, and I'm the president and CEO of the Parks Alliance of Louisville. We're a nonprofit that supports more than 100 of our public parks, and this event is actually our largest fundraiser. How long have you been involved with the Jack-O-Lantern Spectacular? Well, it's funny. I joined the board of the Parks Alliance in January of 2013, and and that October was the first Jack-O-Lantern Spectacular. So we as a board agreed to be the nonprofit partner in the event, and then I went on to be on the board for five years and then was the first employee of the organization in 2017. So I've kind of been around from the beginning. Well, that is very interesting. So since you do have that whole perspective on the history, why did you guys want to bring this to Louisville? What is the excitement behind the Jack-O-Lantern Spectacular? So in 2013, the head of our Convention and Visitors Bureau came here from Providence, Rhode Island, and he was familiar with Passion for Pumpkins, and they were doing Jack-O-Lantern Spectacular at the Providence Zoo. So he came to town and talked to, at that point, May 
Mayor Fisher and said, we have got to get this show to Louisville. And they went and shopped it around to some other nonprofits, all of whom said, uh, pumpkins in the woods? Like, are you crazy? <laughs> no, we've got too much at risk. And we were such a small organization that really we didn't have anything. It's like the mayor said, well, they want us to do this? Sure, we'll go ahead and do it. And I will tell you, were it not for Jack Lantern Spectacular, the Parks Alliance of Louisville as it exists today would not have happened. Really? Yeah. It absolutely. The revenue that is generated off of this event allowed us in 2017 to bring on me as staff. And then we are now up to four full-time and one part-time staff and have gone on to raise millions oh. of dollars for our public parks because of this event. So the money is going to a really great cause. Exactly. While people get to enjoy something that's really fun and exciting. In your opinion, what do you think does make this such a special event? Why do people love it? You know, it's one of these things that you cannot explain. You just have to experience it. I mean, you can say 5,000 pumpkins on the trail. We hire 30 local artists to do these incredible, intricate pumpkins. Every year we have a different theme. Even if you come the first week of October to the last week of October, it's a different show because those intricate pumpkins that they put on the trail only last three to seven days depending upon the weather. So the artists are here carving 24-7 throughout the month of October in order to keep the trail stocked. So one artist may do, I just remember one year we had Cinderella. And so it's like, oh, we will always have a Cinderella pumpkin, but then it's up to every artist to do what they want to do. So the first Cinderella pumpkin that was on the trail was done by one artist and it was the bippity boppity boo Cinderella. And then that pumpkin rotted and the next artist that did a Cinderella pumpkin had the pumpkin coach in it. So the show is continuously changing, new theme every year. The other events are actually in zoo. So now there's a third one in Minneapolis, but in Rhode Island and in Minneapolis, they are both in the zoos. And ours, of course, I'm just a little biased. (laughs) Ours is, I think the best because we are going through the woods and when you think about the trees and it's not through some concrete path in a zoo. They're lovely events too don't get me wrong but (laughs) we're the best. (laughs) So tell us you mentioned 5,000 pumpkins how do you get 5,000 pumpkins in a season for this event? Well I will say that our production company is very intentional about working with local farmers and it it took a number of years to get them to the point where they could produce the number of pumpkins that we need and the size that we need. But we are very proud to say that all of our pumpkins are purchased from, are locally grown by independent farmers. And as we are standing here in this pumpkin barn, we are, what, about 15 feet away from the most massive pumpkin I've ever seen in my life. Could you briefly tell us about this? So every year we end up with a couple of these grand prize winning pumpkins. This one is 1,800 pounds, moved by forklift is the only way it can be moved around. And we usually have one of those in the line of the show. So it's a really nice way for, and we'll put, you know, hay bales around it and decorate a little bit but kids can climb on top of it and play and it's a great photo op so we do have these award-winning pumpkins and we laugh and say the farmers that grow these demand when they rot or if we gut them we have to overnight the seeds back to them they are you know that is something that they have worked on for years and years it's a scientific thing now it is a scientific thing and they have bred i'm using air quotes these these pumpkins and you know that's not not something you give to somebody to grow their pumpkins or just throw in the trash. They're too valuable. It almost looks fake. It is so massive that it's hard to really process how huge this pumpkin is. We will definitely be including some visuals of this. One last question for you. You've obviously got this wonderful history with the Jack-O-Lantern Spectacular. Do you have a story that stands out to you? Yeah, I have to say that I am continually amazed at the number of people that make arrangements to propose on the trail. And when you're just periodically on the trail, I've caught, I think, two of the proposals, just walking the trail myself to see how things were going. 
and you kind of stumble upon and what folks do is they reach out to our production company they can have a custom made pumpkin put on the trail to surprise the bride to be and then it's so dark on the trail and no you're not really paying any attention to the people around you and in this case he like stopped she saw this pumpkin you know will you marry me whatever her name was will you marry me and then she looked up at him and then realized that they were surrounded by all their friends and family (laughs) that she had not even noticed while they were walking the trail so oh look I'm just getting goosebumps even talking about it so that that is a really cool thing I love that Actually, here's Travis, one of the founders of the Jack-O-Lantern Spectacular. My name is Travis Reckner, and I am one of the partners, owners, creators of of the event. My dad came up with this idea in 1988. And I mean, it wasn't at this scale. It was a few hundred pumpkins on the hill. But he thought of pumpkins in the woods would be really cool. And then the artwork just evolved. Every year you get an idea, what if we tried this, what if we do that? And you know, I remember the first time my dad said, we could put image on a pumpkin. If you put a light bulb in it, he, he went in the living room, took my mother's lamp out of the living room, put it in the deck in the backyard and stuck a pumpkin on it and it, the whole thing would glow. He's like, we could put anything we want on a pumpkin. And my mother's, where's my lamp? But yeah, and then from there, it's just a few hundred pumpkins turned into several hundred and several hundred turned into a thousand and a thousand turned into a few thousand and just grew and grew and grew. Wow. So for this particular Louisville Jack-O-Lantern Spectacular, yeah. are you the person or one of the people who literally kind of stored Storyboarded. Here's yeah. how we're going to lay out our different skits. Well, I talked with my dad, and Polly lives in Louisville here. He and I moved here in 2014, and we both met the loves of our lives and stayed here. But we'll even right now we're already talking about next year. Wow. So it, once this show's up and running, I'll get to actually go in the art studio and do the intricate pumpkins. That's my favorite thing to do in the world. For our listeners, can you just quickly define what you mean by intricate pumpkins? The in, Yeah, see, we have our own language. The intricate pumpkins are the large 100 to 200 pound pumpkins that are set to specific themes that artists spend hours and hours painting on and then carving. We call those the intricates. The jack-o'-lanterns, we refer to them as the fillers. Yeah, they're kind of like the pawns of the chessboard. Back when it was just one event and it was smaller, my sister and I and our friends, we would do all all the carving. So in terms of knowing when you have to replace, is that just a matter of kind of walking the trail and eyeing the pumpkins or is Yeah, that oftentimes they'll let you know by collapsing. Uh, they turn the liquid, but sometimes they'll lose their glow, so you can't even really make out what the image is anymore. And then the other variable you get is a beautiful pumpkin and then in the morning you come and the squirrel ate the face of it. Oh no. <laughs> or a deer or a woodchuck or, you know. But yeah, we go through every day and you kind of forecast, you can see the spots. You get really bright spots. That means there's mold growing in there. And we now have fans in every one of the big pumpkins which keep the fruit flies from colonizing. Because nice. they're the fruit flies will wipe out a pumpkin in a night. Wow. I just heard Providence, our show in Providence, they opened last Thursday. Okay. And it's been warm. They're already replacing pumpkins. Which today? Monday? Yes. Yeah, so Thursday, Friday, Thursday. Five days and they're already... Having to replace. They're already tr- trying to just maintain what they have. Because what's really fun and the best thing is in New England it gets colder faster. But once it gets colder and they preserve, then you can add to it. And you get it bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. Here in Louisville it stays warmer longer. Mm-hmm. Hopefully we can just maintain what we have here. But if, you know, if it gets cooler, we just keep, you don't slow down. You just keep it going. The fun part for me is the ma- maintaining it. Once you get it up, it's one thing. But keeping it going for 30 days, basically a compost pile <laughs> strung out through the woods that you want to look like an art gallery. Who designs the layout? Who decides where all the pumpkins go? I do. Polly does. Sometimes it gets dictated by props and where props can fit. So... You get parameters set by that, and then you kind of fill in around that. And you kind of want it to get a flow. Kind of like the skit over here, it goes from Are We There Yet, which is all kids 
stuff, and then from there it goes from channel surfing, and then channel surfing to island hopping. So it kind of, you try to get some sort of flow to it. Yeah. For you personally, mm. what is something that you love about this event? First of all, I got to just say, I wake up every day and just thank whatever powers there are and the gratitude that this is what I do for a living. I mean, it, it makes me laugh. You know, I remember I used to be in the culinary world. And when, you know, this was just a family event. It was a school fundraiser for the school system I grew up in, a small little town. And then the city of Providence approached us to turn it into a fundraiser for their zoo. And I was cooking then. And then I said, hey, I'm, we're going to go do this pumpkin thing. And people are like, you know, are you crazy? What are you, what are you thinking? <laughs> you know? So it's been a long, windy road to get here. But, I mean, I, you know, which specific part do I like? I just, it's almost like being in the now. Whatever process is being taking place at this time is my favorite. Planning it, it's nothing better than, a, hey, out of the blue, y'all yeah, get a call from one of my partners or friends. I was thinking, what if we did this and that? Then actually coming up with the plan, but then executing it, getting it out here and building it is, is great. And then maintaining it, like I was saying, that's the whole other, I get maybe that could be it. That's the most satisfying thing is watching the weather report because when it gets warm and rainy, you know, it's you're not sleeping for a few days. And then it's called the pumpkin blues at the end when you're taking it down and you're watching it come down piece by piece and then there's no pumpkins on the trail. And everyone's kind of just looking at each other. And, you know, the artists are all like, hey, we'll see you next year. <laughs> yeah, I, you know, the camaraderie is just amazing. It's just the passion and love for it shows. And that's what people appreciate so much is, is all that goes into it. I mean, they start putting pumpkins in the trees in August and just spend hours on top of hours. I mean, that's a lot of work. That's one thing I can't do. I hate heights. <laughs> so I, I can't get in the trees. But everything else I, I really love to do. I'm sure one of the things you must love is getting to see how you have connected with your audience. So do you have any good stories of a reaction or some kind of a response from an audience that, that stands out to you? It's funny. I, I was just talking to one of our artists up in Minnesota. We just opened up there last weekend. They asked us to do a carving demo in the zoo, and it kind of was just dropped on us. So we have a new artist, and she was at the studio, which is at the location like it is here. And we said, hey, would you mind giving a carving demo? And she, she's like, no, I Okay. So she goes out and spends an hour and a half, two hours doing it and comes back. And I said, how'd it go? And she's like, this is the most amazing thing it's ever in my life. She goes, I've never been complimented so much. You told how amazing and wonderfully talented I am. I could do this every day. This is just incredible. And I, and it reminded me, I said, you know, I, I remember back in the day we used to touch the pumpkins up on the trail but we had to stop because it would create a bottleneck and it, she, I remember it's true people would just be like I felt like the fifth beetle like they're like oh and I'm like, this is so great but then one time I was saying I was on the trail touching up my pumpkin and there's people become very protective of it and this guy grabs my shoulder I mean grabbed me he said hey I wouldn't do that if I was you and I said no it's okay I, I work here and he wasn't buying it and he starts tugging me I'm like I'm about to get my face punched in by some guy. <laughs> but, it, your but people are like, oh, don't people smash the pumpkins? And I'm like, no, people are really protective of them, which is just an amazing thing to me, you know? It's connecting with the people, or people ask, what's your, which ones you do? And I always say, well, which was your favorite one? Then I said, if that's your favorite one, I did that one. But, or the other question that really kills me is, did you do all these? You know, like, yeah. I did them by myself. I had I had two other guys. So. Yeah, I'm, I'm still just blown away every year that people love the pumpkins as much as they do. My last question is, what did your dad think of his original idea and then all of this? Uh, he's never dreamed that it could be at this scale. And, you know, we're in three markets right now. And not just 
the scale of it and the success of it, but the actual like level of artistry now. He was a mailman for 33 years. He didn't miss a day of work in 31 years. He would use all his vacation for the six weeks of pumpkining. And, you know, he's 77 now, and he's retired from the post office, but he's not retired from pumpkins. You, they were just guys telling me up in Providence they can't keep him from gutting these giant pumpkins. He's in there trying to pick them up. Keeps them young. You know, I just can't. Now, I've got four kids who my daughter is obsessed with pumpkins. So we have another generation. I think so. Yeah, so it's, yeah, it's really cool really fun to see. They're here. Are we talking about the artists or the pumpkins? Both. Here's Aileen to tell us what it's like from the artist's perspective. Hi, my name is Aileen Day. I am the studio director here at the Jack Liner Spectacular in Iroquois Park in Louisville, Kentucky. And what I'm doing right now is actually just kind of putting the last touches on our in-memory Bob Barker that will go out on the trail momentarily. We always have an in-memory section on the trail. The patrons really seem to like seeing people they recognize on pumpkins, so it's usually a pretty popular skit. And sadly for the world, there's been some really notable losses this year, but as a pumpkin artist, there's been some pretty great faces to put on pumpkins for that section. So I kind of end up doing a lot of portraits myself. I I like them, and some people prefer not we have people that loved putting animals on pumpkins but i like the faces i enjoy that so we've put a bulb in the back and i've kind of blocked out the light in the back so i can really see what it might look like on the trail and i have this really fine tool that i'm using right this minute which is just like almost the width of a tack i suppose and ironically this was my um, granddad's carving tool so it's really fun that I get to use it here you know in my creations so I can just do the slightest little scratch on him with with this tool and it really makes a difference people are used to jack lanterns that get cut all the way through and then you know you light from within but with these intricate pumpkins of ours which is what these artistic pumpkins are called we call them the intricates we actually do a very shallow carve and manipulation of the pumpkin like all these little high lights in his face really are mostly done with sandpaper and then it's about the contrast between those touches on the pumpkin and then this black ink that we use so with bob you know i like to fill up the pumpkin and make a nice complete image so i put the the wheel and i don't know how many people will catch it but i did put him stopping on the 99 instead of the dollar because he died at 99 and there were a lot of popular memes about him not going over a dollar and so i thought that's going to be fun we like to hide little I guess you could call them Easter eggs in the trail. People love doing that. We love sneaking pumpkins on pumpkins because, I mean, we're passionate for pumpkins. We're jack o spectacular. So we'll, um, like our great artist, Amy Villager-Harris, finished her pirate pumpkin today. And on the pirate ship, the cannons were shooting pumpkins at the enemy ships. So there's stuff like that. You know, the, what do you call the Jolly Roger, the pirate flag will probably be a pumpkin with crossbones instead of a skull. We love doing stuff like that. I mean, it's fun for us as artist but then it's really fun for the patrons to find stuff like that on the trail how long did it take you to carve this particular one um well again for me oddly i have a knack with the portraits and i i kind of can do them fast not always i say that not on wood man the next one i do is just going to be a nightmare (laughs) because i said that but i probably took well the wheel was actually the most work so with him i probably took about three hours drawing uh, him and then the carving i'd say two and that, that's really pretty fast for me. Most of my pumpkins take about six, seven, eight hours to draw. Of course, I'm getting up and down a lot helping our artists, the manager in here. But, and then carving. Carving usually goes a little faster than drawing because it depends on how much information you put in your drawing how fast the carve can go it, it you know it depends on the content but usually another four or five hours carving how is it determined which artists will complete which creations we actually have a sign-up sheet so we have the entire trail on a clipboard we have the all the podiums numbered we've designed a certain amount of choices for people to to pick within those we like to vary the skits so it's not all portraits so one you know a landscape a face so it's really dynamic and really interesting interesting for people but we need our we want and need our artists to be inspired and excited so I have like a whole seven page list of backup ideas because I want my artists to find something that inspires them that they can get excited about how does 
the theme impact your ideas and your creations? Very much. We're always trying to come up with something new, but there are classics that we try to get into every trail because there's always going to be a Kentucky pumpkin, you know, with horses and a nice pretty white fence. And you'll see that that's the last pumpkin of the trail this year. Anyway, so this year, the theme being wanderlust, I don't know if y'all know this, but it seems to me everybody I know was traveling this past year. Everybody was back on planes and traveling i know so many friends that went to europe this past year and so many of our artists did too so when we knew the theme i was able to reach out to my artists and say hey you know you could put your vacation on a pumpkin get inspired while you're out there and come back and they are yeah it's really fun i love to hear fun horror stories do you have a great story of when everything went wrong um well everything can't really i mean you can drop a pumpkin and that definitely is happened i did do a bit for a news station last week and i was super carefully making a pumpkin for it and it was thank goodness it wasn't too far into it and thank goodness i wasn't live on air but pretty late the night before i was working on the pumpkin and i realized i had completely spelled something wrong on it (laughs) and uh so i had to i had to really i scared everybody because i i screamed out something when i realized it i said oh no bleep 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 (laughs) and then everybody thought what why and half most people couldn't even see it in there because but then they saw they were like oh yeah 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 you messed that up so you know you just improvise what did you do yeah how did you fix i was at a point where i could still kind of take off a lot of the ink and then just work the letters a different way and so that that was a good time for me to find it i hadn't really carved out that letter yet so that wasn't too bad but i mean i have um i've learned to keep my fingernails down to nothing during the season because the way i hold my tool i have many times clipped off somebody's nose with my fingernail and then you know you can't once you peel that off you really can't Can't put it back back on and so you know then you then you distract (laughs) then that's when you say well this maybe isn't the focus of this pumpkin anymore I'm going to put something really sparkly over here so nobody knows that this guy doesn't have a nose so your your highest intention is save this pumpkin always 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 these pumpkins aren't cheap you know it's by the pound the farmers of course were buying in bulk where these pumpkins come in full semis at a time on the back of a semi and we've gotten four deliveries like that so far this year and we'll already we already have another one lined up in just a few days i have two final questions for you that bob barker is gorgeous do you have a favorite portrait that you've done i love prints so much i was gonna do like this huge when doves cry moment and all i I thought about the him in the bathtub i just wanted to go you know go bananas on the thing and but that year the weather was bad and the pumpkins were rotting so fast that you know I barely had any time to do anything like that but I still did a prince pumpkin that year that I absolutely adored and then well what did you end up going with Oh, it was just a head okay. shot with glasses on, and I did, like, flowers all around him. And then his signature, that prince, that real angular way he wrote prints on the cover of um, Purple Rain and stuff. Okay, my last question is, why should somebody become a pumpkin artist? Well, there's just something so unique and special about it. And it's just so much fun to tell people that you're a professional pumpkin carver. I can't tell you. It's the best icebreaker conversation starter <laughs> you can imagine. I used to work in music business and rock and roll and i would really be in like all the dressing rooms i'd drive around all sorts of rock stars and people would say you've got the coolest job and i say well actually this is my second coolest job because my other job is professional pumpkin carving and then when you meet those rock stars too and you say i carve pumpkins and they say what and then you show them a picture and they can't believe what they see and then you know you can relate to that person as an artist too i mean it's just so much fun it's 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 been so much fun for me over the years but then being here together with our co-artists in the studio is we look forward to it all year round and we get so excited to be back here and see each other because there's just not many environments the older we get to be in a space with artists and we're treated well here we got this great place to be we're right by our trail we're in this beautiful park in louisville and you know we love our our group here we love our family carving on a pumpkin is incredible it's i mean they light up they're living the fact that it's temporary
temporary is really neat too because even though we do all want to do our best and 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 feel that the pressure is different because it is going to rot and go away so it's not going to be here forever so it's a different kind of creation and it's really really special for you, obviously, as a mm-hmm. studio director, mm-hmm. I'm assuming you're full time during this season. What mm-hmm. about your artists? About how many hours a week do they devote to this job? It's different for each one. It is, it, everybody's got a different s- scenario. Uh, we have people with full time nine to five jobs that then come uh, here afterwards. You know, they have a little dinner with them. Really dedicated. It's really awesome that we that we they do this. We have a few people that take time off from another job to dedicate more time to the trail this time of year. Lisa, my uh, co-studio director, she and I, this is our job. We squeeze everything else around this. So it's just a case by case. Everybody's got a story. It's alive! It's alive! It's a live event. And here is Morgan to finish out our set of interviews telling us more details about the Jack-O-Lantern Spectacular. I am Morgan Reining. I am the Director of Marketing and Communications for the Parks Alliance of Louisville. The Parks Alliance of Louisville puts on the Jack Lantern Spectacular every year as our largest annual fundraising event. So we work with the 120 plus parks in Louisville, Kentucky, one of the parks in which we walk through for the Jack Lantern Spectacular Trail. But every ticket that is sold is invested back into our public parks directly. So it really is benefiting our community as a whole. Thornton's is our presenting sponsor this year. They're back again which is awesome. And then we have two special nights, one of which is the pre-lit bash sponsored by Heaven Hill and another is sensory night sponsored by PNC. I love that idea of the sensory night. Could you share with us a little bit more of what that is? Absolutely. Sensory night has become very popular and it's near and dear to our hearts. We open an hour before usual. So the trail typically opens at 630 each night. We will open at 530 and we are free of the lights. Typically we don't have any what we would consider strobe lights, but there are flickering lights. We turn the lights off. We open the trail while it's still light outside and we also are free of music so it just allows a different experience while still enjoying the pumpkins we may have some listeners who would be very interested in attending that what night is that specifically yes that is october 24th this year we open up the hour before and everyone's welcome to come you can come anytime throughout that night but we recommend you come while it's still daylight so we have had a chance to speak with a couple of artists which has been fascinating but we forgot to ask how do you pay these artists or are they is it a volunteer position Definitely not volunteer. This is a lot of work, a lot of commitment, a lot of time for volunteer work. So each and every artist is commissioned by Passions for Pumpkins and they are paid. It just depends on the hours, the time, how often they come out here, how many pumpkins they make it through, but everyone is paid for the work that they're doing here. This event is so unique and special. Can you tell us in just a few sentences from your perspective, why is this something that everybody should come to? This has truly become a family tradition for a lot of residents here in Louisville, Kentucky. We also touched all 50 states last year, so people are coming from far and wide. I think when we first started out, there wasn't much barrier to entry in the Halloween market, and everyone loves pumpkins. So everyone is really into that, and we find this very fine line between spooky and scary. So you walk through the woods, and you have music set, and it is a lit trail, but nothing is jumping out at you. It's it's open to all ages, is really what it comes down to. And I will say that everyone around here is very passionate about their parks. We are the Parks Alliance of Louisville. That Ty comes in with pumpkins in the park. So you're actually walking through one of our largest parks here in Louisville, Kentucky and able to enjoy the experience through the trail. The last skit that we have on the trail is it's going to be the My Kentucky Home. So you'll see that pumpkin at the very end. So it's like you're traveling through, you're wandering through the entire trail and you're making it back home. So outside of the pumpkins and the trail, are there any other special features that your event offers? Yes. So one of the biggest concerns about the Jack Lantern Spectacular is how long you have to wait. We have had over 100,000 people year after year attending. So you can imagine that lines can be long. We have started offering beverages, we have food trucks, we have a photo booth, we even have a big mascot Jack, so Jack the Pumpkin from Jack O'Lantern Spectacular, so he will be walking the trail, you can take pictures with him, you can interact with him, you can get your food and beverages, we have merchandise that's available for sale, so we try to keep it pretty interactive while you wait. As someone who has worked very closely with the Jack O'Lantern Spectacular, do you have any moments or stories that stand out for you? All the moments stand out, but I think the most interesting that I have been 
been part of directly is how rapidly we have to switch out these pumpkins if weather is not conducive. So there was one year that we went through, I would say seven rounds of pumpkins. And when I say rounds, I mean semi trucks are bringing in mass quantities of pumpkins. So you can imagine how many pumpkins that is to switch. And I know one artist in particular went through about 73 pumpkins just on her own. What advice would you give for our listeners who are planning to attend? I would recommend that you come on a weekday, if at all possible. It's much less crowded. You don't have as many people to fight through on the trail. You can kind of go at your own pace. I would also say that you shouldn't arrive too early. If you can come close to your ticketed time. So when you buy a ticket, you reserve a time slot. We now work in one hour time slots for arrival. So say that you have a 630 ticket. The time on your ticket is when you get in line to enter the amphitheater, not necessarily when you begin the jack-o'-lantern experience. Should you allow any extra time? for parking is is parking an issue sometimes Parking can get backed up depending on the day and time that you come. We have parking attendants, so we try to run it as smoothly as possible. They'll get you to the lots that they can. If you're coming from a far distance, we have golf carts that are running all night long to help get you here, especially if accessibility is an issue. We are trying to be as accommodating as possible, but I would recommend 10 to 15 minutes. What's the latest time that you can come? During the week, you can arrive at 930, and on weekends, you get here at 1030. So what's your favorite part of your job? We are currently building a new park. We are over 120 plus parks in Louisville, Kentucky, two thirds of which are in underserved neighborhoods. So this event really allows us to go back and fundraise and invest in our parks, build new parks, maintain old parks, bring parks to communities that typically did not have a chance to go out and play, a place they felt safe, a place they could adventure. So being able to do an event of this size that raises so much money to be able to go back and fund those underserved communities, it's the icing on top. I love that. So you get to see, I know it's work too, but you get to see the fun of the event and then the impact that it can make when people participate in this and and support the community. That's wonderful. Does being around all these pumpkins affect your love of pumpkin pie or, or pumpkin spice drinks? I think it might make it worse. I'm not a huge pumpkin lover when it comes to food, but a pumpkin spice anything can get me. And when you come out here and you smell the pumpkins every they do. They have some sort of smell as long as they're still good. It just entices you even more. Thank you so much. It's been so fun talking to you. Likewise, thank you for coming out. Be afraid. Be very afraid. To miss this, because the Louisville Jack-O-Lantern Spectacular is just that, spectacular. And here we are to give you our impressions after having a chance to walk through the trail during our sneak preview. Ashley and Brian, as two people who've not been through the Jack-O-Lantern Spectacular before, what are your thoughts? I thought that was so beautiful. Mm -hmm. I loved all the music. I loved how they had the themes and Mm -hmm. how they tied into each other. And it just, I was walking through going, this is so beautiful. Mm -hmm. I I knew it was going to be lovely, but I didn't expect it to be that breathtakingly beautiful. And the main pumpkins, they weren't even on yet. So Mm -hmm. I can't even imagine how gorgeous this is once those are all turned on. Right. But they said they were going to light them at about two or three this morning yeah. before they actually light the, what they call them, the intricate ones. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, you were talking about how beautiful it was, but it was very Disney-esque the way the sound system was set up so that you hear the particular song that was for the theme of that particular area and walk. 20 steps yeah and you don't hear the old music you hear the new music i noticed that too it was done very well like that i i used to live out here back in the 80s and would walk through the through this when it was just a park and this is lovely what they've done out here the expansion on the amphitheater Mm -hmm. and everything that they've done people in louisville i don't think understand what a treasure they have in the parks the city of louisville has i I couldn't tell you i think she said they were opening a new park tomorrow how many parks do they have you know growing up here i've been in louisville most of my life and you know seneca park and cherokee park and here at iroquois park you know when i when i was in high school but there are hundreds of parks and People really need to do things like this and spend more time with their families, with their friends, enjoying the parks in the city of Louisville. And Mo made such a great point earlier. She said the money from this, Brooke may have mentioned it as well, that the fundraising from this event is what allows them to do exactly what you're saying. So it's so nice the way it pays it forward, I guess, if you want to phrase it that way. As people who have been here before, how did you like seeing the behind the scenes? You've seen it just as as consumers, but now how what is the difference with seeing the behind the scenes today? 
Well, one thing is uh, when you're here with the crowd, you have the the festive atmosphere, and that's really fun, seeing the little kids and their reactions and everything. So that's an enjoyable part of being in the crowd. But being here kind of behind the scenes, you really had a little more time to stop, and there's so many pumpkins, thousands, that you could just take a little more time to, to kind of analyze each one. And you could come back multiple times and still find something new to look at every time. But I enjoyed having a little more time to stop and look without, you know, worried about blocking somebody or being in the crowd. You could appreciate the artistry. Oh, yeah. And they've definitely added since the last time we came. There was more props, um, you know, some of the houses, things like that, different size, variety of pumpkins. It seemed like there was more up in the trees. Just the whole thing seems to have grown in scale. It made me think about it in a different way, of course, coming at it from this angle versus being somebody who's who's simply participating in the event as a, as a customer. And I think what struck me the most is just how special it is to be in the atmosphere of the woods. I mean, you know, you already have the spectacle. They do such an amazing job with the spectacle, the lighting and the pumpkins and the artistry and the music and the themes. All of that's just gorgeous. But then you're feeling the autumn weather. You have leaves under your feet. The trees are towering over your head. And I think the atmosphere just absolutely sets this apart. I think you and I have already said this off mic, Ashley, but how many things go on for Halloween? You have trick-or-treating, you have some parties. There's not a lot. This is just such a fun, special, unique experience that is so family friendly. I think that's what really hit me is what what I enjoy so much about it is is just how unique it is and also how accessible it is to everybody. It's a full sensory experience. It really is. Well, I guess that brings us to the end, Ashley, and I think it's pretty obvious who we are going to cheers to the Jack-O-Lantern Spectacular team who brought this to us, who made all this possible, and who have been so incredibly gracious to us in allowing us to go behind the scenes to see all this in action. We are so impressed. We are so grateful. Cheers to you. Cheers. If you love what we do, please rate and review our show. Or you can become a supporter by making a donation through buymeacoffee.com slash scandalwaterpod. Whether a single gift or a recurring monthly donation, it would go a long way towards supporting our work and allowing us to keep the tea brewing. At our website, www.scandalwaterpodcast.com, you can submit questions or your own story ideas, access our sources and show notes, see the merch we offer for sale, and more. You can Join the Scandal Water community through our Scandal Water Podcast Facebook page or follow us on Instagram or TikTok at Scandal Water Podcast. This episode was executive produced by Candy Thomas, that's me, and Ashley Raymer Brown, that's me. It was researched and written by Candy Thomas and edited by Ashley Raymer Brown. A special thank you to Josh Martin, who wrote, composed, and performed the Scandal Water theme and other music, Matt C. Adams, who created the artwork, and Joshua Reith, who designed our website and provides ongoing technical support. As a reminder, this podcast is purely for entertainment purposes. The thoughts and opinions of the host during each episode of Scandal Water are their own and do not reflect the opinions of any future guests, advertisers, or clearly professional psychologists. Thanks for listening.